Welcome to Smart 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 Tells Tells History. History. All right, enough with the echo and fanfare. You're here for history, right? And not that boring crap you learned in high school. This stuff's actually interesting. Like things you've never heard about the Civil War, Cleopatra, automobiles, Monopoly, the Black Plague, and more. Fascinating stories, interesting topics, and some downright weird facts from the past. It's a new twist on some stories you may know, and an interesting look at some things you may have never heard. So, grab a beer, kick back, and enjoy. Here's your host, Smarticus. Welcome, dear listeners, to another episode of Smarticus Tells History, the podcast that brings you the most extraordinary stories of people and animals and their incredible feats. I am your host, Smarticus. And I am your co-host, Phoenix. We'll be telling you the remarkable story of a baboon who defied all odds and became an amazingly trusted employee of the South African Railways. So sit back, relax, and let's dive into the fascinating tale of Jack the Signalman. Are we going to eat food? Oh, I totally (laughs) forgot about that. (laughs) I know, I didn't have a little snippet in here um, talking about it. So this week's because... Uh, we're going to find out here in a second. Um, Jack the Signalman is from South Africa. And so for this dish, we did one of South Africa's very famous dishes called babuti. Boba uh, It's, or yeah, it's, I think it's babuti's <laughs> or babodi. Babodi is how it's pronounced. Yeah, babodi. And it's, it's a fairly simple recipe for the most part. Um, yeah. I used, uh, now you used, a pound and a half of ground beef, right? I did. Okay, so I use I ended up using one pound of ground chicken, and it was supposed to be a half a pound, but I think I actually put a pound of a uh, ground uh, Italian sausage in there also. I think the spices would definitely and, mellow or help it. Oh yeah, so it's uh, curry powder, um, cumin, a lot of onion. And then you put it in the oven for like 45 minutes after you. Oh, don't um, forget the egg oh yeah, you topping. Put the eggs. Yeah, you got to put the egg topping on there. Um, and you you soak three pieces of bread, which I thought was really weird. Uh, <laughs> it just adds extra body of, and binding to the uh, meat. Yeah, you soak three pieces of bread in the uh, in milk. And uh, oh, that is good. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, oh, don't forget the chutney. And oh yeah, you got to put chutney and apricot jam uh, mix in there. That's um, really good, and it's really good. It, this is really good, yeah. It's it's and surprisingly creamy. It's yeah, I think it's partly partly to do with the uh, that might be with the amount of chutney and uh, apricot, and then the egg mixture on top of it. Mm-hmm. I was ready for food. <laughs> I don't, I'm sitting here trying to think. I don't think I even had breakfast or lunch today. Me either. I don't. I woke I up and I was think off that and I running. Did eat. Yeah. Yeah, I had to go feed my brother's dogs and and uh, uh, I just I don't. I'm trying to think. I don't think I had anything to eat. Um. So anyway, so there's lots of onions and stuff in here, and this is really good. This is a, a South African dish. Um, I actually found it, found the recipe on a website called Taste of the Place. It's a international res- recipe uh, from a lady. She does, uh, I think it's a blog, um, mm-hmm. you know, not a sponsor or anything like that, but she does like a blog of just all kinds of different international food, and that's where I found this recipe at. And, I followed uh, her. I'm sure there's her notes about. Um, she was talking about how if you were going to cook it, if you're going to cook most of the things like the meat and the onions in one dish. And then transfer it over mm-hmm. into another dish to, um, to cook it in the oven. Oh, use a cast which, iron skillet. Right. Well, I didn't yeah. have a cast iron skillet, but I have a Dutch oven. And I oh, was yeah. like, that'll work perfectly. So I just threw the whole thing yeah. in there. You know, I'm, and I didn't even think about it. I have a, um, I could have I could have done it this way. I have a cast iron. Uh, well, it's enameled cast iron. Mm. Um, uh, like lasagna plate or lasagna dish. Nice. Like a baking dish, like a thick, you know, like a three inch thick one. Mm-hmm. And a casserole dish. I'm sorry, that's what they're called. Casserole dish. And uh, I could I honestly I probably could have just cooked that right on the stove yeah. and I could have done the same thing with it. Um and uh but no I, I dirtied up 
two uh <laughs> two skillets because you I forgot them. Yeah, I forgot <laughs> to uh I I started making the, the meat before I read the instructions. <laughs> and, and so I sit there and I start I pour the meat in, and I start cooking it or whatever, and then I look over the instructions and the very first thing says put the vegetable oil in the pan and cook the onions first. And I was like, shoot! I was like, I already screwed up. So I had to, so I brought out another another skillet and then I cooked those up while I was cooking the meat and I just mixed it together. This is such a homey dish. Yeah. It's almost like um, uh, beef stroganoff, maybe, like a different version of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's no, and, and there's, there's no noodles in it. No. Um, but it's got that green, and, uh, that uh, creamy, meaty consistency. Yeah. Yeah. Which is really good. Oh. And it says to use the medium spicy or medium hot curry powder. I did and not do that. I, I used... thought it was going to be spicy, <laughs> but it's not. It's not spicy at all. Hmm. And it's got it's got spices, but it's not heat. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I meant. Like it's not spicy. Like right. Hot, hot temperature hot. Well, I finished my bowl, and I can promise you, I'll be going back and getting more once we did, we're done recording. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. This is this is man. This is really good. Oh, it good would be fun. really good over noodles, though. Not you mentioned oh, yeah. or stroganoff, or a bowl of rice. That'd mm-hmm. be really good over a bowl of rice. Heck yeah! All right. Okay. Yes. So now that we've finished up our our little bowls <laughs> of uh, the babodi. Um, which again, that was, I mean, that was, that was pretty good. I'm, I'm like you said, I'm going to have to go back and get more. Yeah. Um, our story begins in the late 19th century in the Eastern Cape region of South Africa. The railway system was expanding rapidly during this time, connecting various towns and cities, providing a vital lifeline for the transportation of people, goods, and resources. However, the rapid growth of the railway system came with its fair share of challenges, including accidents and human errors. Human error is the important part to take note of there. (laughs) One such error occurred in 1884 when James Jumper Wide... Oh my gosh, is that really his name? (laughs) Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. James... I I didn't even notice that the first time when I wrote this up. That's hilarious. (laughs) You know... I wonder if they named him that because he jumped wide. Right! Oh my gosh, but that's just, you know, right there when all of a sudden everything lines up in the universe and you get a really fun name. Like yeah. Like Phoenix Butt. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, one such error occurred in 1884 when James Jumper Wide, a railway signalman, tragically lost both his legs in a shunting accident. Despite his disability, Jumper was determined to continue working and adapted by using two wooden peg legs which, you guessed it, earned him the name Peg Leg. <laughs> they just got rid of Jumper altogether because yeah. he's not doing it. Yeah. He's not jumping no more because he's got no legs. Poor Peg Leg Pete over here. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, the poor man. Oh my. But life on the railways certainly... got certain... no legs, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> but life on the railways certainly wasn't easy for Jumper. He needed help to fulfill his duties as a signalman. Enter Jack a chakma baboon that would change his life. Jumper first encountered Jack while visiting a local market in the town of Eatonhague. The baboon's owner, a trolley driver, had trained Jack to push his trolley, and Jumper was amazed by the baboon's intelligence and ability to follow instructions. Seeing the potential in Jack, Jumper decided to buy him, hoping that Jack could become his assistant and help him with his duties at the railway. You might be wondering how Jumper managed to train Jack for such a complex and demanding task. Well, it turns out that Jack was a quick learner. Jumper would spend hours working with Jack, teaching him how to change the signals, pull levers, and use the railway key to switch the tracks. Remarkably, the baboon proved to be an apt student, and soon he was able to perform these tasks with ease. Jack the baboon became an indispensable part of Jumper's team. His keen sense of hearing and sharp vision allowed him to detect incoming trains from a distance. Whenever he heard a train approaching, Jack would quickly run to the appropriate lever, change the signal, and guide the train safely through the junction. Not only did Jack perform his duties flawlessly, but he also developed a unique bond with the railway staff. The employees were initially skeptical of a baboon working on the railways, but they quickly grew to appreciate and respect Jack's intelligence, dedication, and hard work. 
In fact, many of them began to treat Jack as one of their own, sharing their meals with him and making sure he was comfortable during his rest period. I just want to point out that I'm not entirely sure that I would want to get on a train that's being engineered or piloted, whatever the word is, driven for whatever it is that you that you do on a train. Uh, I don't know if I want to get on a train if I knew that the baboon was in charge. I, it would make me a little um, twitchy. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Um, I mean, in almost all retrospects, you're never going to see him. You're never going to know he was there. Right. I mean, as a passenger, you'd have no I, clue. Why would you? Yeah. You, I mean, in the movies, of course, they always show, you know, oh, you, you can always see the guy through the window. Like, I've, now, I, I mean, I don't know about the one, I've never been on the ones in, like, in New York or in Washington, D.C., but I have been on the ones in Japan. And the ones in Japan, I never saw the dude driving it. I have no idea what he looks like. Right. You know? So, I mean, it could have been Baboon then, and I wouldn't have known. <laughs> you know? <laughs> So, yeah, I, but if I had known, like, and let's be honest, like, I feel like that should be one thing. Like their passengers should know, Hey, you're riding a train that's being driven by a baboon. No, wait, he didn't drive. He only switched the tracks. Oh, okay. That's, that's a good point. But even still, (laughs) I mean, still, still, what if he like messes up? What if he, I don't know, decides that there's something else. There's a pretty female baboon. Yeah. If he's busy. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Did you see that baboon in the red dress? <laughs> <laughs> Her makeup oh, looked man. nice. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Uh, she was she was in the uh, train going the opposite direction. <laughs> Ships uh, in the night. Yeah. All right. Um. So, however, not everyone was. Yeah. See, not everyone was thrilled about a baboon working on the South African railways. Some people considered it to be a dangerous and reckless idea. And they voice their concerns to the railway authorities. I mean, I would probably Rightly be right so. there with them. Yeah. yeah I sir. mean, so in response, an official investigation was launched to determine whether Jack was fit to perform his duties and if his presence on the railways posed a threat to public safety. During the investigation, an inspector put Jack to the test, asking him to change the signals and switch the tracks in various combinations. To the inspector's astonishment, Jack passed the test with flying colors, proving that he was indeed capable of handling his responsibilities on the railway. As a result, the railway authorities decided to officially employ Jack, granting him the title of signalman assistant, and even providing him with a salary and an official employment number. Oh, I looked up the salary, by the way. It was... Oh, yeah. What was it? Let me see real quick. I had it written down. Was it paid in bananas? No! Funny enough. Oh. (laughs) This baboon got paid 20 cents a day, which is quite a lot considering the time, and a half a bottle yeah, well, of beer each week. Wow, yeah, what was the year again? I don't remember, did we it say? It was... Uh, ni- early 19th, or late 19th century. Yep, he died uh, 1890. Okay, yeah. Eight, yeah, yeah, okay, so 1880s-ish. Yeah, that's um, quite a bit of money. Yeah, back then, yeah. Um, he's, But it sounds like he obviously, probably... you know, earned the money. But yeah. it's just kind of one of those things you're like, wow, and a bottle of beer at the end of every week. Good job, Jack. Yeah, good job, you earned Jack. This. A bottle of beer. Yeah. Jack's story is a testament to the intelligence, adaptability, and resilience of animals. It also highlights the potential for interspecies cooperation and the ways in which animals and humans can work together in harmony. The fact that a baboon could be trained to perform such complex tasks and be recognized as an official employee is truly remarkable and challenges our perceptions of the capabilities of non-human animals. I like that, by the way, that gets that gets added in there, the non-human animals, because so we are. We're we're animals and people. Oh yeah, we're yeah, we're animals. Yeah. Yeah, we're hundred percent animals. Um and uh, I mean we're you know, we're just we're just another species. Um and we just happen to be the, you know, the most intelligent species on this on this planet. Well, sometimes, that, you know, <laughs> yeah, sometimes, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes I question our human. Like, mm. <laughs> I wonder. Yeah. Um. And so I, I kind of chuckled back then, uh, or back there, a little bit when I was talking about how humans and animals can work together in harmony. And I was like, how often does that really happen? But then I sat there and I thought about it, and I was like, we use police dogs and stuff all the time, right? And, those, uh, you know, um, they sniff out bombs and, mm-hmm. you know, drug dogs, whatever. Well, and speaking um, of Africa, they have those, what is it, they're ginormous rats 
down in Africa and some of those countries that still have those huge fields full oh, of bombs. Um, they're the they they train the rats yeah. to go sniff out the bombs so they can dig them up. Yeah, I can't remember the name of those, but yeah, I know, I know what you're talking about. And uh, and then, but I mean, like elephants, they do amazing things. Mm-hmm. You know, they're smart. You know, they can do all kinds of stuff. I mean, so it's not as far fetched as you know as one might think. Right. And uh, well, actually, you know, <laughs> we, we actually do use them quite a bit. I mean, I mean, we, and. And we do. I mean, monkeys are incredibly smart. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, dolphins. Dolphins are super smart. Yep. Um, so, you know, we use dolphins and sea otters and, you know, uh, sea lions. Probably not sea otters. I don't know if we use sea otters or not. But sea lions and stuff, you know, they, they sniff out uh, uh, those old sea mines and stuff uh-huh. in the ocean. Yeah, exactly. I think they, I think they do stuff like that. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, I think they also use them. Um, because they can travel down much deeper depths than like a person can. Right. Um, they use them to uh, collect like seashore samples at, and sometimes. Oh, that's cool. Um, stuff like that. Yeah. I was actually friends with um, a lady for a couple of years. I don't know where she moved. I can't remember. But she actually worked over in San Diego with um, it was with the marine biologists, but also it was with in, in tandem with one of the military branches. And they were training dolphins for that, and she got to work with them for a couple yeah. years. That was one of the coolest experiences she'd ever had. Yeah. Um, I think dolphins would be kind of hard to do, like, getting them to get, like, collect samples from the bottom of the ocean. I said seashore earlier, and I was like, that's not the, <laughs> the seashore. I'm not going but, there. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Like, dude, like, just, you're sitting on it. Just grab a sample right there. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, um, but like an otter and st- or a sea lion and stuff, because they, you know, they have, they could use their flippers at some, you know, and much different manner than like a dolphin could. Right. Uh, they can use them almost like hands. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they could actually, you know, grab things and stuff like that too. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's really cool. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, we, we actually do use animals a lot more often than, than, uh, uh, you know that, rem- and that reminds me. You know, I I hate snakes. I absolutely can't stand them. <laughs> I'm terrified. I'm like a little girl. <laughs> I see snake. Um, and if I know that they're there, I'm okay. But when they surprise me, nope, I'm gone. <laughs> so, um, uh, but so so it reminded me, um, mm-hmm. this whole thing of I saw. I can't. I don't know if it was a Facebook reel or a TikTok reel, or whatever. Um, you know, one of those little short clip, you know, video clip things. Right. Um, of, I want to say it was a, uh, exterminator or something. He used a python. Yeah. Yeah. You just, he just stick stuck the python the right in the wall. Yeah. The python went in and a whole bunch of rats came out. And a minute or two later, the python came right back out, followed him. And I was like, <laughs> Jesus Christ, man, that's, that's pretty ingenious. But <sighs> what, what happens if the python didn't come out? You know, now, now you got a snake <laughs> right. trapped in the walls. You know? Oh my gosh! And, well, I mean, maybe had a little track <clears throat> device in them or something, you know, embedded in them. I know? oh god! As soon as the rats come, I've seen the video. You're t- well, one of them, I'm sure, but I've seen yeah. that. And as soon as the rats start to come out, I flung, I like, I flung, I flung my phone. <laughs> oh yeah! It's so bad. It's like, no! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely uh, not. Yeah. But anyways, yeah. Yeah. So. All right. So. Now, uh, now that we know that Jack's employment on the railways was met with both admiration and skepticism, as we stated earlier, some people were initially concerned about the safety implications of having a baboon working on the railways. However, once Jack proved his abilities and demonstrated his dedication to his work, public opinion began to shift. Jack became somewhat of a local celebrity, and his story was reported in newspapers both in South Africa and abroad. His story does continue to captivate and inspire people today. As which, you know, we're doing it now. Obviously. That now, obviously. <laughs> so Jack is often cited as an example of the remarkable feats that animals are capable of when given the opportunity and proper training. His tale has been featured in various books, articles, and documentaries, and serves as a reminder of the incredible bond that can exist between humans and animals. Now, that brings up a point that I'm wondering. Mm-hmm. Um, what is that old book... Uh, George and the guy with the yellow hat. Uh, uh, yeah, um, Curious George. Um, yeah, Evie um, was obsessed I with I wonder him. if... Uh, yeah, my my nephew and niece were too, I think. Um, and it just makes me wonder if that was somewhat inspired by 
by you know that's Jackson a Sigmund really or whatever. Good question, because um, George. That's comes immediately from the what jungle. I thought of. Right. That's what, that's immediately what I thought of when I read this. Um, How just funny. Now, just, it, it may or may not be. Don't don't hold me to that. <laughs> I'm just. <laughs> I can be, be wrong. I'm human. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Even pigs make mistakes sometimes. Even pigs make they're, mistakes sometimes. They're yeah, supposed to be super right. smart. Actually, they are. Yeah. Oh my they are gosh. Super smart. Yeah. I love pigs. They're so funny. Yeah. Jack continued to work alongside Jumper for nine years until his death in 1890. It's said that Jack passed away from pneumonia, and his passing was deeply felt by both Jumper and the railway staff who had grown to love and respect him. Jack was buried near the railway line he had dutifully served, and a small memorial was erected in his honor. What an incredible story of determination, resilience, and the power of the human-animal bond. Jack the Signalman's tale is a shining example of what can be achieved when we open our minds to the potential of animals and recognize their intelligence and capabilities. Jack's story is a testament to the amazing things that can happen when we work together, regardless of our species. It is a story that will continue to inspire and captivate for generations to come. Thanks for listening to Smarticus Tells History. If you enjoyed this episode... Don't forget to rate and review and make sure to subscribe. And be sure to follow the show at facebook.com slash Smarticus Tells History. Or just click the link in the show description. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.